Good afternoon, evening to you. We uh, here at the Whitehall Church of Christ are in a study of the book of Hebrews uh, in our seniors class. We meet every Wednesday at the building at noon. So if you'd like to join us, if you're able to join us, we'd certainly uh, invite you to come and be with us at that time. We have been in a study of the book of Hebrews after concluding the study of the Levitical sacrificial systems where we delved into the old Hebraic way of doing things by the Israelites and the old covenant and how the new covenant has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Jesus reminded us in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, don't think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy. I came to fulfill them. So everything that we have has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. We no longer need to make sacrifice uh, as they did in old using the blood of bulls and goats. We have a new and eternal sacrifice in Christ Jesus. And that's very important for us to remember because as we go through this study, remind yourself that we're looking at the better things of Hebrews. We're looking at the things that are the reality and all in the Old Testament is nothing but mere shadows of the reality uh, in the new. And so we're going to be looking again, Hebrews chapter 9 so if you would read along with me, I'm reading from the ESV translation, Hebrews chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand, uh, the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Above it were the cherub, cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. And of all these things we cannot now speak of in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, the holy place, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, but he, and he but once a year, and not without the shedding of blood. Take that into consideration. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. So, sins that were committed unintentionally, sins that we commit every day and we don't even realize we're committing, sins that we don't or are not cognizant of because we're not conscious of those things, but we've still sinned and violated the holiness um, or uh, exposing ourselves to the holiness of the presence of the Almighty God. It, um, God the Father deals with sin through his Son, uh, and his blood eradicates uh, that sin. We are in remission of our sins uh, because of the blood of the Lamb. Verse 8, by this the Holy Spirit indicates the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. And what he's talking about, he's talking about when Christ Jesus was crucified on the cross and the temple veil was rent in two from top to bottom. Uh, he was exposing the most holy place. He was exposing the desire God had from the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. Um, and he created Adam and Eve. He created uh, the first man and the first woman. And he was in constant connection with them. This Edenic paradise where the father uh, conversed and walked with his creation in the cool of the day. This is, this is the... Um, this is the utopia. This is what God had created from the beginning, and his desire was it was for it to stay that way. But in his omniscience, he knew that it wouldn't. And so he made provisions for that through his son, Jesus Christ. Well, prior to that, under the old covenant, the Israelites were to sacrifice bulls and goats and calves. If you were uh, poor, you would sacrifice a turtle dove because you didn't have that much money uh, for the sacrifice that you were going to bring to have your sins remitted. Interestingly enough, the priest that would step in on the place of the people first had to sacrifice for his own sin, and then he would sacrifice animals for the sins of the people. I always thought that was fascinating because when Christ Jesus came, he didn't come from the Levitical line. He didn't come from Aaron's line. 
Jesus Christ came from the order of Melchizedek. And because he came from the order of Melchizedek, who didn't have any beginning or end, uh, or, or any record of it, um, thus Christ Jesus is eternal from before uh, anything was ever made um, throughout eternity. So uh, we need to bear that in mind as we go through this uh, section of Scripture. Um, according to the arrangement, um, oh, I'm sorry, verse 9, which is symbolic for the present age. And so in essence, the Hebrew writer saying Christ Jesus has come, the temple veil had been rent in two from top to bottom. Uh, interestingly enough, I've um, heard of uh, or read about where a Hebrew went back into the temple and sewed the uh, veil back together, thinking that uh, it was just a, an earthquake, a happening, um, nothing significant behind that. But in essence, what uh, Jesus did is that he fulfilled everything in the old covenant and he brought it to the new covenant. Another word for covenant is will. A will is not enacted until a person dies. Uh, the same is true even yet today. Thus, Christ Jesus enacted his will, uh, death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Um, and the Hebrew writers talking about uh, the arrangement that was made under the old, uh, the old covenant when he said, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. I just, I, that was fascinating to me when I reread that because uh, under the old covenant, the only thing the old covenant was capable of doing was shining a light on the sins of the people. It never gave a remedy for the sins of the people. It just uh, shined a light on the sins and um, there was no cure. Uh, the sins were atoned for, yes, when they would sacrifice the animals under the old covenant. But you and I need to understand and appreciate the fact that Jesus's blood covers both old and new in both covenants. His blood covers those who were faithful back then as well as even yet today. Verse 10, but in the old covenant, that's what he's talking about, it dealt only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. And so in essence, the only thing that it really took care of was the external uh, applications of the worshiper. Jesus even uh, expounded on that when he said, you know, don't just wash the outside of the cup, but wash the inside of the cup. And you know as well as I do, if you're doing dishes, you clean the contents of the cup out, and you're pretty well taken care of the outside as well as you wash it. And so Jesus was saying, focus on what's in the inside, not on the externals. You, you Pharisees, um, scribes, hypocrites of the law, you're focusing on the externals as opposed to the internal. Verse 11 but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, notice that, those things have come to fruition because Christ Jesus is our high priest. Then through the greater and more perfect tent, I want you to notice this. I want you, I want you to notice the transition that takes place that the tabernacle of old in the old covenant uh, in the wilderness surrounded by the tents of the Israelites becomes more perfect. It is us not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood. Thus he has, he has secured an eternal redemption. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more? through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience. Guys, this is coming from the Holy Spirit, strictly from the Holy Spirit. And the reason I'm saying that is because all inspiration of God is given and is profitable for instruction, for, for reproof, for correction and righteousness, so that we can be fully equipped. We are the temple of God today. We as Christians, I should say, are temples of the Holy God. And we serve him we serve him as we live in his word because his word is living and it is alive. Uh, his, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld the glory of, of the only begotten full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the word uh, and in, in him, there is no blemish at all. Because of that, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, those of whom have been immersed into Christ. And that spirit, that Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. 
it draws us back. It connects with our and purifies our conscience from dead works. Why? To serve the living God. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. Um, we need to realize that all of these things that we have come from him and him alone. And we are given those abilities to serve him. Verse 15, Hebrews 9, verse 15. Therefore, he who, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Notice how the blood of the Lamb goes both ways, Old Testament and New Testament. For where there is a will involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes place and effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Christ Jesus came, he gave himself willingly, he sacrificed himself for us, he was buried in the heart of the earth, rose on the third day. We, in like manner, through baptism, are buried into the waters of baptism to have our sins washed away, to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 18, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. So under the old covenant, under the Old Testament, they had the blood of bulls and goats um, and a heifer or whatever that they would bring as a sacrifice for the priest to offer in this earthly tabernacle. Moses was given that picture when he went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. He was also given a picture of the heavenly sanctuary, um, something that many people, when they uh, have been ushered into the presence of the heavens, don't even have words to adequately describe how beautiful it is. Um, as was Paul the Apostle when he was ushered in the third heavens after being stoned in Lystra. Verse 19, For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels that were used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That is such an incredibly important passage for us to realize. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Had Christ Jesus not shed his blood, we would have no forgiveness of sin. You and I need to understand the significance of that. Verse 23, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, namely Christ. Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are mere copies of the true things, but he has entered heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters holy places every year with blood not his own, but rather blood of animals. For then he would have to have suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. If Christ Jesus had to offer himself on the cross again and again and again and again, he would have had to have done that from the foundation of the world because it was God in his omniscience that gave us the plan of salvation through Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world was ever laid. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice, notice this, of himself. And just as it is appointed for man once to die, after this comes the judgment. Pretty well gives up the argument for reincarnation, does it not? So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you eagerly waiting for the return of the Christ? The next time he comes... The heavens will pass away with a roar. 
in the twinkling of an eye, those of whom have died will be caught up in the air. Those of whom have done evil to eternal destruction, those of whom have done good to eternal life. And it's not that your salvation is based on your goodness. Your salvation is based solely on Christ Jesus and what he's done for you. Your response to that is indicative of the works that you're going to be performing. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, those works are going to be tested through fire. Uh, if it is wood hall straight, it'll be burned up because we are going to be purified through fire when he comes again. I'm just, I'm expressing that to you because it is so important if you've not yet dedicated your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, I'm encouraging you to do that. There's no greater life, there's no greater blessing that you can receive than living your life in connection with the Almighty God. He is your source of life, not just for this life, not just for the 70 or 90 or however many so years we're alive on this earth, but for trillions of years to come in eternity as we are reunited with him. Father, thank you for this incredible gift. I pray that uh, those of whom fall under the sound of this voice today will understand that this is a call for each and every one of them to dedicate themselves to you through your son, Christ Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Um, we give you thanks and praise. Father, just uh, bless us this day. Encourage us in every way we pray in Christ. Amen. Have a great day and remember the one who gave it to you.